Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 435th New Social Environment. I'm Nick Bennett, the Special Projects Editor here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Julian Schnabel, Donation Gros, and Raphael Rubenstein. We're thrilled to have the poet Andre Kodeshkru here, who will close to, uh, today's program with a poetry reading. A few notes before we get started. Here at The Rail, we are celebrating our 21st anniversary by working on our first ever endowment campaign. This initiative will ensure that the print edition of The Rail and our public programming celebrating cross-pollination in the arts, humanities, and sciences all remains free and accessible for generations to come. Please check the chat for more information and links that we will post in just a moment. The Rail also acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions that we'll be posting in just a moment. For now, to introduce today's guest and hosts, uh, the multidisciplinary practice of artist and director Julian Schnabel extends beyond painting to include sculpture, film, architecture, and furniture. In 1978, he began to make plate paintings, imagic works with sculptural surfaces produced by layering shards of broken dishes with thick applications of auto body putty, dental plaster, and oil paint on wooden structures. His unorthodox, highly experimental approach to use of materials, gestures, and form, and large scale, and shaped paintings have blurred the distinction between abstraction and figuration. His current exhibition, Julian Schnabel, Self-Portraits of Others, is now on view at the Brandt Foundation in New York through December 30th. Co-host today and head of contemporary programs at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, Donation Gros holds doctoral degrees in French and comparative literature from the Sorbonne and philological uh, and historical sciences from the École des Hautes Études, Paris, and a doctor of philosophy from Oxford University. Forgive my French. He is an editor of large of uh, Purple Fashion Magazine and here at the Brooklyn Rail. He has published widely on the arts and culture of the Roman Empire on 19th and 20th century literary and art history, and as well uh, on contemporary art and culture. Uh, art critic and poet Raphael Rubenstein is the author of numerous books, including The Afterglow of Minor Pop Masterpieces and The Miraculous. He edited the anthology Critical Mess, Art Critics on the State of Their Practice, and is widely known for his articles on provisional painting. A professor of critical studies at the University of Houston School of Art, he divides his time between Houston and New York. He is a contributing editor to Art in America, where he was also a senior editor and is currently an editor at large here at The Rail. So without further ado, handing it over to you, Raphael and Donation. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, so I'd like to start uh, at the very beginning, I was really struck by uh, in Nick's introduction, the by the title of the show, uh, uh, your show, Julian, um, of the uh, self portrait, uh, self portraits of others, which uh, it's only now I realize what a kind of strange concept that is, or, or a kind of contradiction. And I was, I guess, my first question to you is where. What is that about and where did that come from? Uh, and how can something be, from your perspective, both a self-portrait and a painting of someone else? And all the questions and issues that, that um, these concepts uh, bring up. That's a good question. Um, well, Donacion titled his essay, Self-Portraits of Others, which is the essay of the catalog of the exhibition. Um, I don't know, Donacion, if you'd like to say anything about that before I, uh, before I do. Um, I'd be curious just to see what Donacion would, would say about that, but I definitely will answer your question. Okay. Donacion? Well, thanks, Julian. Um, a couple of years ago, when I was in New York, I went to see these extraordinary uh, but I was staying at Julian's says, and I, at the studio, and I'm, when I'm with Julian, I, I have access to the studio all the time. And it's incredible because I couldn't go there any time. And you see these extraordinary paintings. And basically, what they all were, were playing with 
the notion of the self-portrait, which is of course a very important notion in our history, which Julian has made uh, in, in his own way, but they also have portraits made by other artists. And I think this tent of which Julian sort of took on. And I think that tension between the self-portraiture and the otherness is at the very heart, heart of what everything Julian's been doing, that's tension, which you can find everywhere in his work. And so that's why, that's where the phrase self-portraits of other came about, because they are literally self-portraits of others, made by others, but they are also self-portraits by way of others. And this tension between the individuality, the strong individuality and the otherness, you know, struck me as being what they all have together, whether it's through Velasquez or Caravaggio or Van Gogh or Frida Kahlo, they're all playing with an aspect of otherness as well as with individuality, both of the painting, um, of the painting, of the artist who made the original self-portrait, and of course of Julian himself, and to an extent of all of us. So that was my initial thought. Thank you. Um, so, um, Raphael made me go back to what, uh, now that uh, Donacion uh, talked about the other artists that are, that are uh, their paintings of other artists other than Van Gogh in this, um, in this exhibition. Um, I made a movie uh, about Vincent Van Gogh a few years ago with, and, and Willem Dafoe played Van Gogh in the movie. Uh, in order to make the paintings in the movie look like Van Gogh, who was being played by Willem, the paintings needed to look like Willem. So I painted paintings of Willem in the style of Van Gogh as props for the movie. Uh, and in the course of making the movie, uh, I, looking at Van Gogh's work, I realized, I mean, most people know this, but I, it, 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 it became more and more uh, clear that he was making paintings of his own paintings. There are more than one 15 sunflowers in the same position because he was not just looking at painting from life, he was painting paintings of his paintings. And um, so uh, at a certain moment, and I guess when I made the movie also, uh, the movie's really not about Van Gogh, it is, uh, you are being Van Gogh. It's, it's done in the first person and so, you're experiencing what he's experiencing. So it's more about being him than being about him. Already that being said, I am not him. So making, being the assumption that I could make something about being him is already a kind of a big leap. Um, these three paintings that you're looking at on the screen, can we get closer to them, Nick? Make it, uh, is it possible to do that? or not really, to where you just push in on the computer. Yes, just one moment. Okay. Sorry, let me just reformat this. Okay, so let's go closer, right into the middle, right into the middle painting there. Uh, just keep pushing in. Okay, so that is Willem Defoe posing in a similar position to the self-portrait that Vincent made that's at the Musée d'Orsay. If we, and, and, I, and I felt like I couldn't really just do it in one painting, but I painted three versions of Willem as Vincent in the Musée d'Orsay. If you turn around and let's see the other, on the other side of the wall, um, We can go to another, another, the next image somewhere. We'll just see what comes up. There you go. Okay, so why don't we push into that? I mean, in fact, you really see that um, that Willem doesn't really look anything like Vincent. But we suspended our disbelief for a while when we made the movie, and um, and one thing about. Um, I guess one thing about using broken dishes as a surface on your paint, get closer to that painting for a moment, please. 
is that I essentially take what I get. Can you get closer? Um, there happen to be and move to the uh, move over. The, can you move? The, yes, perfect. And get closer. Uh, there was actually a, a vase going through his face and uh, different plates that would arrive at a certain moment on the on the rectangle. And basically, I paint what I get. And there's a randomness about what the receiver is, uh, as well as a definite intention about why it's there. Uh, can we pan to the left bit, to the to the one to the, the painting to the next, uh, to the end? Yes. And I don't know if we could get closer or can we move around? So the fact is that even the paintings of Vincent look quite different. Um, so why don't we, uh, let's do something for a moment. Um, can we back up and just see the room? So why don't we do this quickly first so as not to get too, okay. There's three paintings of Vincent as Vincent across were three paintings of, of Willem as Vincent. And then um, can we go to the end of the wall or what, are, what other things are in your slideshow there, uh, Nick? Uh -huh. So that's how you walk into the room. If you wanna go over to the Brand Foundation, you can see them in the flesh because I think it's sort of pathetic to look at them like this. And it's just um, like looking at a menu Later, you have to eat the food, but this is just the menu that you're browsing. So go straight to the end of the wall if you can. Is that possible? Julian, would you prefer if we look at them individually or? Mm, I kind of like the idea, but uh, you can just, pre okay, press the button because they're still not the paintings. But if you go to the end of the wall there, if it's, yeah, you can, well, go straight to the end if you can. This way? Yeah, uh, to your left. To the, to this no, way. Right to the center, the center of this. I'm talking about the center. Just go straight to the center. Yeah, so I, it's maybe it's a little blurry, uh, but we can look at that. I made three paintings of the Mon Ami Paul painting that Vincent sent to Paul Gauguin as a gift. Um, I, I didn't want to put nine paintings in that room. So you want to, hit the button, maybe we could see a, a singular, a single image of it or the two paintings in the back room. We you just hit a button and we'll, so it's not too, um, keep going. Okay. Yeah. Did you want to go to, to these? I wanna, okay, well, yes. Uh, so this is a painting. Uh, uh, there are three versions of this painting also. Um, that's one, that was the first one. You can hit the button. This one was the third one. It says number two, but it was the third one. Um, and I just think um, that maybe the best way to do this is just let's look, let's just see here another one. I, I want, it's, okay, so there's three paintings uh, with this image that morphs from one painting to the next. Um, and that has to also to do with the way the plates are on the, on the, on the structure. Uh, can, can we go to the next floor? Let, let me see your, can we see the side panel of all your uh, images on the, yeah, the, the audience can see that too? Yes, Does they the, can. The audience sees the whole, this is good. The audience can see the you, me, the painting, or I don't know what. Yes. Okay, so that's fine. So you see the, the paintings in the room and just uh, move up like that. Yes, the other way, the other up, um, down, okay. To, to the next floor, you're saying? Yeah, uh, you slowly, yeah, and, okay, good. And then you go from these blue paintings to, and let's hit the big, make that bigger. You see the paintings of Vincent with a bandaged ear and there's um, the left side, they're paintings of Vincent and the right side, they're paintings of Willem. This, this next painting we can go to there exactly. It was the first painting I painted of Willem from the prop in the movie. And it sort of began with this particular painting. Um, and we can keep going for a moment. Uh, just like you're doing is fine. Cause I don't, th I think you're just gonna get a kind of a, a Xerox in a sense of what the paintings are, keep going. 
There were three paintings of Willem and there are three paintings of Vincent. That one looks most like the painting that's in Zurich at the uh, uh, Museum of Modern Art there. Uh, and then there's two other versions of that, that one and this next painting, which looks like he's buried under the plate somehow. But I like painting the green jacket over and over and over again. And uh, on the next floor, there's, um, there are four, there's one, my son Sai posed for four paintings. One is of the Christ, uh, which is sort of like the Christ in the Titian painting that's uh, where he's quite small, but he has this ghostly light around him and the color of his skin at the Academia in Venice. Uh, and then that's Sai as Christ. And then there's three paintings of Sai as Velasquez. Can we get closer? Is that a possibility? And those are painted from life. And I think there's a distinction about painting of uh, uh, dead artists. I wanted to paint them from life. So he posed as Velasquez. And then um, on the other, uh, on the other wall, um, and I think it was very uh, serendipitous that the, the wall was this Naples yellow color. It seemed like the paintings were uh, designed for that place. Uh, on the opposite wall, there are two paintings of Caravaggio as uh, Goliath, who he painted himself as Goliath, uh, held his head held up by David's arm. Uh, in these particular paintings. In, in Caravaggio's painting, you see the whole of David. Uh, that is Oscar Isaac, who posed for the painting, uh, stayed like that for a couple of hours and very gracefully. And, and, uh, and there's, there is uh, Caravaggio himself. Um, and then there's one other painting of um, Caravaggio painted by somebody else, because it's the only painting he painted of himself. And that's the next painting you'll see uh, an Oscar post for that. Uh, and then there's three other paintings that are in the next room. Well you could actually you could you could let's not rush we could see these other ones up close because it's it's something I guess. Hopefully whoever's watching this program would be interested in seeing them in the flesh because this is a bit of an anemic version but it's we're working with what we have. Uh, next these are all uh, soft. Julian? Yes. Julian, um, I wanted to ask a question about the, uh, these particular plate paintings. And which is, as you say, it's like hard to get that from photographs. It, it, I feel like the, the surfaces, the, the way, the kind of the way a lot of the broken shards uh, project out from the surface, it seems to me it's a much more challenging and irregular uh, surface than your early plate paintings from the late 70s and early 80s, where things seemed, the plates were broken, but they were much flatter. And I feel like there's now much more three-dimensionality to the, to the uh, plates. Is that, is that true? No, I don't, think that, I don't think that's true. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the, the three-dimensionality of uh, what we're talking about is the, the the plates were not painted over, so a lot of in a lot of the cases. So the 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 the, the dissonance between the the reflective quality of the plates and the matteness of the bondo or the oil paint created a jarring uh, uh, conflict that uh, fragmentation. You sense that more, and I think in these paintings where I'm painting over all the plates. Uh, you don't have that happening. And what happens is obviously you get the, uh, these shadows when the light is brighter uh, or overhead. If you turn the lights off in the gallery where if you go there and ask them to turn the lights off, you don't really notice the plates and the image comes out more. So there's always a battle between the depth of field, uh, pictorality and the object. And I think that that conflict uh, between uh, mark making and uh, the surface that it's on is a big topic to me, not just of plate paintings, but of all my work. So, um, uh, but I never thought in a million years when I painted the first plate painting, The Patients and the Doctors, that I was gonna paint 
a painting of my son as Velasquez on uh, a painting or um, paint flowers uh, on the plates or, but in the evolution of whatever I was doing, I looked at it as uh, trying to create an alphabet. I went from painting, uh, do we have an image of the patients and the doctors over here somewhere? Let's see if we do, we'll get to Frida after, I guess. Okay, can we move up close to this? Is that possible? Ah, there you go then, okay. That is the first plate painting from 1978 called The Patients and the Doctors. And so obviously, you know, if you talk about the three dimensionality, uh, you've got the, 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 the disagreement between the white plates and the ground and this central panel comes out of the wall about a foot. But when you see them photographed, you feel like it gets flattened out. There might as well be cotton balls or something like that. And so um, in a sense, these are sort of anti-cubist paintings where the cubists, uh, took something that was flat and painted it to look like it was three-dimensional. And I took something that was three-dimensional and turned it into something that looked like it was flat under the right lighting conditions. Or, But obviously, mm -hmm. when you say that about the three-dimensionality, you could see it looks quite three-dimensional in this detail. But I think, Julian, there's also this tension between unity and multiplicity, the unity of the work, the multiplicity of the shards, which is something you can also see in the new series because... They're all about individuals, but the fact that you chose several of them opens up the, the, to the notion of multiplicity. Yes. Yeah, I, and I think also in just looking at this fragment of this painting, I mean, what's the deal about painting on broken dishes? I mean, why in the world does somebody do that? Uh, and I think that the fact that we're familiar with this material uh, that we eat off of plates, uh, the fact that they're solid in a way, but they can be broken. And ultimately painting has to do with uh, fluid. Uh, and, um, um, and so there's a kind of a crystallization or I think um, where these things have kind of melded into something that was solid, uh, that's some transition between their uh, 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 liquidness um, and that uh, is something that has been something that I've pursued through the work. If I think of say the uh, Hurricane Bob paintings where I um, uh, tied these large tarps to be behind my uh, truck and drove over the highway, the weight of the, of the um, canvas on the asphalt, the petroleum like oil paint printed an image on there. And and then obviously as it gets stretched onto a, a, a heavy tarp, it becomes a physical object uh, again. And so this, um, and then if one is to paint on top of that, there's a, another substrate and another distance between uh, what's pictorial and what is objectness. And I think that the found objectness of these plates um, kind of is something that's consistent with all work that I've made that have to do with found objects, whether it be canvases that have, or boxing rings that or things that have been used for other purposes or have some kind of palimpsest of the world before I ever showed up. And, and, and you know, all the decisions that might be in this fragment of this painting where somebody decided to decorate a plate or paint flowers on it or write the price tag on it even. I mean, they're all human gestures that become part of the, uh, the thing. Uh, but anyway, obviously in these new paintings or the ones that the, the plates are painted over and they're broken in a different way also. I glued all these plates down and selected the, um, the colors. And also you see where this thing is sort of smeared, this sort of roplex and, and uh, Bondo mixed together, making some kind of glue that I didn't even know if it worked or not, but it was, uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I don't want to ramble on here. No, there's, I a, wanna... there's a scene, oh, sorry, go ahead. There you go, you go. Um, there's a scene in At Eternity's Gate where Gauguin says to Van Gogh, 
the surfaces of your paintings are almost more sculpt, more like sculpture than painting. And I couldn't help but read that as, as you, the painter slash director, sort of thinking about what that means and, and the surfaces, like what happens when the surface of the painting starts to erupt. And, and I guess you, in some ways, are tracing, as every artist does, you're tracing a kind of genealogy of your work to Van Gogh, to the, at least to that particular quality of Van Gogh, the really built up surfaces. Uh, I think he was trying to paint energy. Uh, I, I mean, he wrote that he was trying to paint energy. I think he did paint energy, if you can do that. And I think that the, these agitated surfaces uh, speak to, particularly if you're painting a landscape or painting these uh, uh, recognizable images on top of them, they uh, exacerbate uh, the not only the image, but the emotionality of the image. I mean, this particular painting, if somebody goes to see it, uh, it really looks like he's buried under those plates. And can we get closer to his face? Can you just push into that? I mean, his eyes are just under there. Some he looks like a mummy in a way. Uh, and um, you know, one of the things about using the plates is that there's a discovery that goes on because the you know I'm dealing with something that's <clears throat> totally random, and I'm not taking a hammer and sort of smashing off a part that might be too difficult to paint over. It's just a challenge and an opportunity. And so uh, uh, it's interesting to paint something that seems to be the same thing, but it's nothing at all like the other thing. It is and it isn't, I guess. Yeah, but I think, Julian, there are also maps, you know, that compose and decompose. You know, if you think of you, the, the blind girl that's behind you, it, it's a portrait, it's also a map. And I think when I see this particular painting, it feels to me like a map like a sort of map of a face, but a map that decomposes and recomposes that is almost that almost ends up being like a bacon. And you can see an inquiry into the face that is quite specific there into painting those faces in ways that are bear a form of resemblance, but then play with that resemblance and create a real plasticity within the face. I mean, all the faces in that series are plastic. Let's they see move, another one from shift. that particular group, Nick. Yeah, it's amazing how different they are from one to the next, but it was pretty glorious to paint his coat over and over or hit this blue hat and the freedom. I mean, I painted them pretty loosely and, and I think that no matter how loosely I painted it, it seemed to sort of co congeal or coalesce. Uh, and um, let's see the other one, which is, yeah, we can go closer to that, maybe just come into that more. And in fact, if you look at that, yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, and then pull back a little bit, it'll look like you can see him puffing on his pipe. The more you start to see the smoke in his cheek, that's okay. But um, it's a, it, you know, painting is an act of discovery. I'm not doing it to show what I know. I'm, I'm trying to find out. It was maybe a quite a dumb idea to um, think of doing this because you know, we've talked about this before. These images are so um, over uh, reproduced. And I mean, most people go to the museum to see if the painting in the museum looks like the reproduction they have seen. Ah, yeah, I know that. I've seen it. I've lived with that. It's on my refrigerator. There it is in the flesh. Now I could go and see the next painting. And I think that the, the um, fame of Van Gogh and the drama in his life or the drama in, in Frida Kahlo's life or the act of uh, Caravaggio uh, stabbing somebody at a tennis match um, exacerbates the, their myth in a way that, uh, that attracts, uh, I think society loves a suicide somehow. That's why Andy's paintings of suicide that are not even interpreted, they're just presented are so powerful. Um, we have this voyeuristic tendency, uh, but that being said, uh, somehow, uh, if I'm not doing it tongue in cheek and I actually try to paint the paintings, I feel like uh, they become resurrected in a way and they're alive with, uh, and, and they're not ironic. Uh, they are 
um, I'm engaged in what, and I think that what you're talking about when you're talking about energy, I think that there's a feeling that you get from the paintings that's something that is hard to describe. I wouldn't even begin to try to describe what that feeling is, but uh, as a painter going from say this eye, okay, if we get close to the way his eye is painted in this over these plates, and that's good, Nick, that's very good. And then cut to, let's see the next, another painting of that particular, uh, uh, the same painting. Uh, let's go to the next one. Yeah, that one, then we'll do the other one last. Okay. Uh, you know, you kind of see what you get, you know, there's a kind of shadow over his nose somewhere, or this thing goes through his eye. And uh, these things are discoveries that are quite, I, I wouldn't call them abstract, but they, as you dissect these things, they become, other images that have nothing to do with uh, figuration. They have to do with seeing. Let's go back, let's go to the next one so we could just see the next one. But what I'd like to see also, yeah, we could go to the, the one you just had up there. Oh yeah, there it is. Come, let's get up close to that one. Cause this one, his eyes are painted in a very different way. They kind of look like, they, his eyes look like they're made out of glass or this vase goes through his nose in a way. and. Um, I like to, so what, years ago when I was with Jean-Claude Carrier, who wrote At Eternity's Gate with me and my wife, Louise Kugelberg, we, um, I was alone with him in the Musée d'Orsay looking at the Antin and Artaud Vincent van Gogh exhibition. And I was looking at the way, can you make the mouth in the center of the painting more? And come, yeah, I was explaining to, uh, to Jean-Claude, you see, his mouth is green, his face is green, and there's just an alarism crimson line with a touch of uh, Prussian blue in there. And he felt like, he told me that he felt like Vincent was talking to him about how he painted the painting. And I think at that moment, we decided to make this movie about Vincent, but we didn't try to make something that was autobiographical. We thought we'll make up the stuff and uh, that way nobody can say it's, it's inaccurate. But that moment of seeing together, I think, um, uh, confirmed to, to Jean-Claude that he wanted to do it. Uh, he died last year at, at, I think he was, he was 89. I don't know if he was 90 yet, but what a brilliant guy and what a great privilege it was to work with him and write with him. And uh, there's a book that he wrote that's not translated into English. It's in Spanish and French called uh, Bunuel Desperté or Bunuel Awake, where he basically goes to Bunuel's grave, who he worked with for 20 years, and wakes him up, and they talk about everything. It's worth reading. Anyway, let's keep going, I guess. Should we go back and look at that one painting of Vincent uh, that was in the middle of the red of the paintings with the bandage? Julian. Yes. I'd like to ask you a question, because I think what's interesting with these works is that, you know, you grew up in the, um, you, you came of age as a, as a very young and very talented artist. Why don't we change the, this image in the meantime? One, one second. In, late, in the late 70s, which was the time of the pictures generation of the pictures show. And of course, they dealt a lot with images that had been overexposed and with the media and actually a number of works, you know, the artists from the generation made were also related to Van Gogh. But I think there is an interesting shift 45 years later that these works you make are, are not about accepting that the vibration of the image is gone, but actually recreating the vibration of an image. And I'm interested that never, that in this. Never, that in fact, never existed before. Yeah. But it's, wow. it's, it's the creation, it's a belief in painting. And I see it's interesting because a number of those very works that you dwell from were used you know, by other artists at that time. But it, and it's interesting to see how you're shifting it back into the materiality of painting. Uh-huh. Well, I'm a painter and uh, for, you know, I mean, Sherry Levine, for example, is a great artist, but she's not a painter. She might use painting to uh, uh, convey her point in an excellent way. Uh, but uh, I don't th think we're looking uh, for invention other than the reinvention of something that is ultimately a flat image. I think it's hard to do this 
uh, I, I think that it's, uh, uh, I mean, is it hard for me to do it? I mean, I've practiced a lot, I guess. Uh, but I know that when I started to paint this painting from a painting by Van Gogh, I thought, you know what? It doesn't look very good. I don't think I'm gonna do this. It's very discouraging. Uh, and I, who wants to make an anemic copy of some other person's painting? And as I worked on it and it looked pretty crummy, I kept this particular painting. I, this was the first one that I thought, okay, I'm gonna make a painting that Willem did not pose for, uh, but it's a painting that I love quite a bit. And, and the, I love the way that this, um, this green turquoise shadow went through his, his cheek. And so this particular one I thought looked more, back it up a little bit, Nick. I thought it looked more like um, Albrecht Durer than Vincent van Gogh. And it felt more like a Durer than, um, call me blasphemous or whatever. Uh, I think if you look at this painting and then let's look at the, what we call the second one uh, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah, this one. He looks much more vulnerable. Uh, there's a there's a different moment where he looks like somebody that's totally different. Um, and can we get closer to it? Even the way his his jacket fit, fits on his on his body. And if you get closer, let's look at his face. It's totally different painting, and you know, felt felt like I needed to see both of them at the same time, and that's why I wanted to show the twenty five paintings at the Brandt Foundation, where we could see not just paintings of Vincent, but the notion of po portraiture. What what is that? And and I think that uh, how color changes over the centuries, and and how uh, conventions change. And then let's go to Frida Kahlo's paintings for a moment, please. And you guys can interrupt me anytime or say whatever you like. I just okay. So I'll interrupt you. So I think what's in you know the Frida Kahlo paintings are very beautiful, but some of those portraits, like this one or some of the red ones, are pretty monstrous. I mean, they remind you of a of a Francis Bacon almost, and the face becomes something you dig into rather than something you build. So I'm interested in this notion of a face that is somewhere between beauty and monstrosity. Uh, well, the okay, let's get closer to this. So the concept of monstrosity, uh, I, I don't know about. I mean, is this woman a monster or is she a beautiful? Um, I, I, what do they say? Pretty can be beautiful. Uh, uh, what do they say? How do they say that? Uh, uh, Truly they. Say it. Is it the French, the French phrase? Yes. Uh, uh, Jolie Lay, something like that. Donis Tian, you know better than me. You know, the phrase, uh, yeah, that, that's the American thing. We say that, but Jolie Lay, we, we never use it in French, but yeah, right. Jolie Lay. So say it for the Americans. Je, uh, like with a French accent, even though it's not a French word. No, just say it in English. Okay, Jolie Lay, pretty and ugly. Two together. Uh, it's, it's what it says really is ugly can be beautiful is the essence, but pretty never, right? U ultimately, that's what that means. Um, um, get, I get want to agree with Don Etienne. I, I saw the Francis Bacon as well, and and some of the portraits there, a couple of them were just when you get up close to the face, it looks like raw meat. That's you know this sort of body that's been torn apart. But a, a few things I just think are important to, um, to, to go into a little more, or I'm curious about in the relationship to photography. Well, can you just keep that thought? I just want to finish sure. up with Frida okay. for a second. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, if you look at her chest, or her heart is painted outside of her dress, and there's a, a, an artery, and then let's go to the other painting of Frida, just to finish my thought about why or who I would include. These two portraits are part of the same painting called Double Portrait of Frida. Uh, and she had an amulet uh, at the end of um, one of her arteries that had been snipped with the scissors. And uh, I don't necessarily think that um, the Van Gogh paintings are might be more monstrous than 
than, uh, than these paintings. If you read, if you read Ronaldo Arenas's, uh, some of his stories where women and men turn into uh, monsters, uh, their vivid imagery that, viv images that sort of correlate with this stuff. But uh, the idea of, of beauty is, um, uh, what is the, what, is, what do you think? This, what, I'm gonna ask you, Raphael, what do you think beauty is? Um, I think it's something that escapes uh, explanation. It escapes it in, in some ways, beauty is, the, you know, it's something we search for, but I think that like, you know, when you, in at Eternity's Gate in the beginning, what one thing that struck me about the film was um, how few words there are in it. There's you know lots of shots of the landscape, sort of seen through uh, Vincent's perspective, and it's it's almost as if you were saying there are things what what I want to talk about here or, or what I want to explore visually in this film are the things that cannot be adequately represented with language. And I think that, you know, I think that, that beauty is like, it's that challenge. It's the, the, something that challenges us to uh, define it and escapes that. But I don't know whether that's really the kind of- That's a good want, answer. But, it's a good, uh, I mean, the thing is that um, I always thought that I don't know what the face of beauty is, but I'm going to recognize it when I see it. And if I look at my or my relationship with these things, uh, do I think that they um, encompass the notion of beauty, whether they are ugly or they they contain images that might be monstrous or uh, uh, so? You know what is beauty, it's, uh, it's funny because I have Louis Bunuel's autobiography here and it says, My Last Sigh, which I read a million years ago, but uh, I've been rereading it. Uh, it's that, uh, also it's that uh, ephemeral thing. I mean, if we were to write something together, we would conspire, we would share our breath. So there's something about breath that, uh, I think you get a sense when you look at these paintings of them being painted, when you're looking at them. And you have a sense of the act of how it's done and the image melded together somehow. And that's the essence of seeing. And that is what my uh, idea of beauty was. Uh, but I also think, Julian, two things. First of all, I think there's an interesting idea in relation to beauty. You were quoting Bunuel and there's a famous quote of Andre Breton, the great surrealist thinker and writer. And he said, beauty had to be convulsive. The beauty was a convulsion, that it wasn't an ideal anymore. It had to have that vibration, that convulsion, that level of risk. And I would love to have you react to this in relation to those works. Second thing I want to say about the notion of monstrosity is that it's not about, you know, it being a monster in the classical sense, but, you know, monsters etymologically mean something that shows something, something that signals something. A monster is a signal. Mm -hmm. And I would love if you just to sort of dwell upon that etymology. So first question is convulsive beauty. Second question is, um, what do these paintings signal? Well, I think certainly I would not be defending about something being monstrous. Uh, and the, uh, so just in terms of just that particular word, I would say that um, uh, all of these paintings are monsters in the sense that they actually are alive. They can, uh, once you interact with one, the monster can come out. Yeah. Uh, and I was, uh, there's a group of small paintings that I made years ago where I, I found these objects and I painted on them. And in fact, the big girl painting behind me uh, was made in 1988. There was a small painting that I found and then I, repainted it in 1990 and in 2001, which is this particular painting behind me. But in the, uh, the Godfather too, there's a line where um, Robert De Niro doesn't want to pay uh, uh, Fanucci and this other guy, Bruno Kirby saying, 
the, the, you got to pay him because if not, this guy's work for Maran Sala and these guys are veramente bestia. They're real beasts. So these little paintings that I had made, 11 small paintings, they were called veramente bestia. So the notion of that is not far-fetched uh, to me. But um, what was the second part of your question? Or Convulsive your beauty. Convulsive beauty, did you say? Yeah, because I was saying that, you know, in a way you have a classical way of looking at beauty, which is this idea of Winkelmannian idea of order and perfection, sort of neoclassical ideal. And then this other ideal appears, which is a beauty is not about the neoclassical ideal of a perfect shape, etc. It's about the convulsion. It's about creating that, you know, tension. And I think in your work, that has to do with that. I mean, everything is a convulsion. Everything has a level of intensity and everything at that level of, you know, uncanny even to use. I mean, you were talking, we're talking about monsters, you know, I, you were a great, you are a great admirer of Mike Kelly and you made, you made this whole, you made this whole series as a tribute to him when he died. And another key word of Mike Kelly is uncanny. These works are extremely uncanny, mm -hmm. I feel. Um, um, Raphael, did we leave you out there somewhere? Did you were, I wanted you to oh, yeah, I, your thoughts. So, um, we could change the image. Thing, I, I feel like the camera really uh, changes and distorts these paintings. And I noticed it myself when I was in at the show taking a photograph. And when I looked through my phone, suddenly this, the image of the, um, the figure became so much sharper, so much better defined. And then when I was looking with my own eyes, not through the camera again, it, 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 it really totally changes. And I just think that's one thing for us to keep in mind and for people watching this to keep in mind. And get I feel like the- this, Just to, to your point, get up close to this painting now, Nick, please. Closer. Closer. Yeah, so I mean, uh, mm. if you look at the way the paint sits on these things, it all has to do with the, uh, pictorial space, depth of field, uh, the get back as we get further. And if the lights go off when you're in the show, if you ask the people, they'll turn the lights off in the galleries and, and the paintings change radically because obviously the shadows uh, create a disturbance or shift the paintings. Can you go further back, Nick? So um, more, please. Keep going, just keep going, yeah. So they'd be, it's, but I think that it's all about seeing. If you go up to a Velasquez painting at the Prado and you look at the way the horse is painted or the piece of material on the horse, uh, it all breaks up into a bunch of little marks. If you look at the way Goya's paintings, uh, the landscapes are painted. I mean, uh, they're painted very quickly and with a couple of gestures that, that capture uh, time of day, capture landscape, capture feeling. Well, I feel that, the, I mean, which is what all great paintings do, but I feel like these, the plate paintings in some ways, because of their you know, being so materialistic and tactile and, and dimensional, three-dimensional, they're, they almost are a perfect uh, critique or antidote or um, reminder that the digital um, images that so, ma so many of us rely on more and more in experiencing visual art are, are, are what they are. They're like, they're the, the necessity or the, you know, the absolute necessity of, of seeing something in person and uh, being able to go close, to go far, to look from the side, to be in the room, to have peripheral vision. Like these paintings make the argument, I think, better than any other contemporary paintings I can think of, like you have to be there and and the the image on Good your choice, phone, on your computer is, I mean, this is great, this video, you do really get a sense of that, but um, I think that, that there's something, and I think that's something that uh, in some ways they're a critique of uh, of photography. And I think the relationship of seeing these paintings in person to seeing them on a computer screen is kind of like the difference between being in a movie theater and watching a film versus seeing it at home on a small screen. 
Uh, let's see another image, uh, Nick. Uh, Raphael, what you're saying is, uh, I mean, you cannot uh, show paintings on a video screen. You cannot see a painting on your phone. If you want to buy a painting at an auction, you see an image of it, maybe you know what it looked like because you've seen it in person. Other people might use it to uh, buy. Uh, uh, let's, look, let's look at the paintings in situ, the ones where Jeremy was photographing and moving around. Why not, you know, just so there's something moving around while we're talking. But um, uh, what was I just talking about? What, I, what was the last thing I just said? Well, you were saying that, that you know, someone who wants oh, to maybe. Yeah, I, I mean, so for example, uh, you have an image of it, even if you have a 3D image of this thing and look at it like that, you'll never know what it's like to stand in front of it. So I'm saying that people can use the internet to sell paintings or make pictures of paintings, or they think they're gonna uh, show something in a painterly way, but it's, it's in the ephemera, it's not the same thing. Painting is painting and that's it. And you either, uh, uh, so I think that the finite sense that, that that's it creates a nice arena where you can perform, where you have to act and uh, what your version of that thing is better be, uh, better be radical and better be um, physical sufficient and able to be scrutinized uh, up close and farther away and, and stand, you know, when you say it looks like Francis Bacon or something like that, well, it, it's not, uh, Francis Bacon's a great painter, but I would think that it wouldn't be enough just to look like a Francis Bacon. It's gotta be certainly as powerful in its way of nature of its own to be, uh, in fact, there's a picture, I don't know if Nick has it, where the painting of Willem is next to Francis Bacon's uh, Vincent on the way to work that was at the uh, uh, the Van Gogh Museum uh, last September, but it was during the pandemic. But uh, I was pretty satisfied to see the way that Willem looked as Van Gogh next to that painting and they were both uh, the same size and they were radically different. Um, it was not that one, it was the one with, uh, it was the one with Willem in the red, uh, in, in the red and green painting. Uh, anyway, maybe we should stop talking and let people ask questions. Is that they all we're asking doing? One last time? How are we doing here? Julian, I want to yes. ask you one last question. You look like Dr. Strangelove with that, with that. It's fantastic with that thing. Go back to him, please, Nick. I, just um, I want to ask you one last question about okay. relation, because I think your work is very much about how we relate to one another and how we relate to the world. And I think, you know, whether as a filmmaker, it's always been about interactions and figures you brought to the forefront as a painter, how you relate to the weather, as you relate to the climate, how you relate to human beings. It, and I see that these works that are about relations to people you are close to, whether it's Willem Dafoe, whether it's Oscar Isaac, whether it's your own son, and to artists you're close to and to a material you've worked on for 40 years, you know, for me, they encapsulate the fact that all your art and all your life is a web of relations. So can you tell me more about this by any chance? I don't think I could say it better than that. I think what you just said is very, very uh, uh, meaningful to me. I mean, uh, you can't separate uh, your, I mean, I think when I had the show at the Musée d'Orsay, I hung paintings, paintings of my own with Van Gogh paintings with uh, uh, the Gauguin paintings with Cezanne paintings with Toulouse-Lautrec paintings with Manet and Monet paintings. And there was a dialogue going around there through the century of um, people in a, in a painted dialogue. And that's what we are in. And, and uh, we can have relationships with other artists that we've never met. Their work is quite alive. Uh, Vincent van Gogh's work is alive. So is Caravaggio's work or all of it, um, any, any, any work that is worth its salt is, um, uh, becomes alive as soon as somebody else, uh, some living being inter, uh, um, has some kind of interchange with it. So 
uh, things that are personal. You know, if I talk to a young artist or they say, well, what, what, you know, will you have any words of wisdom for me? I would always say, keep it personal. If you ask Marty Scorsese about, you know, how do you, what do you, what would your comment be to a young filmmaker? He'd say, make it personal. And I think that uh, whatever that version is, I mean, Blinky Palermo, there are no people in his paintings, but the paintings are personal. The way that the paint is painted on the aluminum, the, just the gesture. I mean, the way that uh, Mondrian said he didn't want to use uh, curved lines because they were so too emotional. But in fact, when he even painted a straight line, it was emotional. So uh, I, I think that uh, there is humanity that we can find in art or we could find a lack of humanity in it. And the lack of humanity uh, can be a physical manifestation as well as uh, 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 the, the notion of locating something that you where you feel the humanness of that thing. It's an absence, we can call it soul if you want. I mean, if you know somebody plays an instrument with soul or in, 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 in Spanish, they do, uh, uh, Lorca would use the word duende. You know, you could go to see Paco de Lucia playing the guitar and, and somebody would just want to have a sex change operation. They would want to, you know, cut their hair out. They want to move to another country just because it was a cathartic, amazing experience. It's, you could also hear somebody play an instrument and there's no magic there. So I think it has to do with magic also and a belief in magic. Well, you're a great magician. Thank you, Julian. Okay, thank you a lot. Where are we kids? Um, I, we're, we're, we're great on time, but um, I'm happy to open it up if you'd like, or I don't know, Raphael or Venetian, if you have any other questions, I'm happy to go either way. I feel like Raphael didn't get enough chances to say what he wanted to say. Am I wrong? Uh, yeah, you're wrong, um, but there's always, there's always more. Oh, good. I'm glad I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just so, didn't need to be. Yeah, yeah magic. I mean, I, I was thinking about, again, like, you know, it's, it's really hard to talk about these paintings without talking about the film at the same time. And, uh, and I know you said that this was usually the films are uh, influenced by your paintings in the past, and here the paintings have been influenced by the film, so it's kind of reversed. But they, they are so, you know, I, I guess. Um, so one of the things that like this idea of, of magic, and I think about, um, you mentioned Artaud, who has been, uh, you know, someone who you have looked at or thought about from the very beginning, there's the painting starting to sing, mm -hmm. where you take one of Artaud's self-portraits, which are to speak about monstrous images. I mean, those are those are, are really pretty horrific. And 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 Artaud, of course, believed that he could he used his his art to cast spells to it. He believed it had magical, mystical um, powers. And and he also famously wrote an essay called Van Gogh, The Man Suicided by Society. And I think that in the film... Well, that's why I called the, the painting The Patients and the Doctors, which was mm -hmm. the first plate painting. So this has been something that's been, you know, you've been thinking about and, and responding to throughout your entire career. And in the film, I was thinking about the relationship to institutions, to you, you portray Van Gogh on the one hand, he's battling against and being attacked by the academy, the art academy. Uh, he's also dealing with the, you know, the institution of medicine uh, and the law. And these, like, I, it's, it's maybe more of a subtext, but I think that, you know, I'm, and I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but like how all of these uh, different strands uh, kind of come in and out of the work, whether it's the paintings or the films, the, the idea of the individual, the artist as an outcast, the artist as someone who has this kind of insane belief in the power of their work and what they have to do, how they suffer from that and how, they, and how the, the, the society around them is in some ways the enemy. And I feel like that's, that's obviously something really 
uh, important and central to you. And I wonder if you have thoughts about why that, why yeah. you, why you have that. Well, I think that I that 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 conflict generates activity. You act in re reaction to that, and and that uncomfortability makes you uh, have to achieve another reality, uh, build your own reality, and make your own world. Uh, dissatisfaction with things, an uneasiness. It's it it's it it's obviously it can be a very productive impetus for doing something. Um, let's go to the painting of Willem with the, uh, with his, with the hat. Uh, but what I wanted to say, you know, when I was making the movie, I just want to take you with me to the hospital. First of all, we shot the movie in the hospital where Vincent, thank you, Nick. We shot the movie in the hospital where Vincent was interned. And Willem uh, sat in this office with uh, uh, a young actor named Vladimir Kosini, uh, who played the young doctor, Dr. Uh, Ray. And for Willem sitting there, he's not acting. Willem is sitting there. He is channeling something with, with everything that he knows and doesn't know about himself and about what this topic might be. And he's on the spot and he's pulling out of the air, uh, conjuring up this character, which is himself. And obviously it's his non-self because he's gonna walk out of there later. And he's, uh, he's supposed to be, but the point is he's not acting, he's being. Uh, there are moments in this, uh, in making the movie where he's climbing up the side of a mountain or he's, walking through some reeds that have uh, very sharp edges and his arms are outstretched like Christ in a way. And he's feeling the, the rapture of whatever uh, that is. And uh, so we have an actor playing Van Gogh, but the actor is also playing himself. And for the actor to put himself through those confabulations and those contortions in order to do that, to achieve his the essence of what his art is, is there are these parallel lives that are going along and there's no hierarchical judgment about that. And so it's a, very, it's a breathing, living thing that, that we're talking about. The art is an organism, it's, whether it's in a painting or whether it's a recorded picture and becomes a film. But Willems uh, and other actors, and I mean, the, the gift of what they could do, even though it's very hard to put your finger on because it's 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 intangible but it is it is ever present and omnipresent hello is it time for your poem yeah. Andre? uh if you like of well course. i think bef I, I, before we do get into poetry sorry to interrupt but um, I do think we are going to take a few questions from the audience if that's okay with you all but one question did 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 uh did Raphael have something to say after I said that? I just saw, uh, I just saw uh, Andre's face, so I thought it was poetry time. <laughs> uh, what did you think about that, Raphael? I think that, um, you know, I think that uh, that that your description of um, of Willem Dafoe um, and and being in the space, I think that like. I guess one thing that strikes me, like the fact that you, it was important to you that you filmed in the actual um, building, the hospital where Van Gogh was, where Vincent was. And that means that you, you know, I think that's also a sort of belief and an act of faith, the belief in the, in the sort of symbolic, magical, um, power of a particular location and that it's like not something you would get from um, shooting in a studio and I think that that's in some ways again it's like the the idea of I don't know the the aura of the work of art the uniqueness of it the the sense of presence like being present and um, so I can see this connection um, definitely between what happens in the paintings and how you approach them 
and and what you're doing in the film. The wind was a protagonist. The wind it was absolutely the those those silent. I mean, it's no words, but just the wind uh, was the first thing. Oh, I do have one more thing to say. And Ezra Pound, have, right? Ezra Pound said, "Let the wind speak." Uh, um, and who said, "Not me, but the wind that blows through me." I don't know, but he could have said that too. <laughs> uh, I don't think so, though. Um, so, shall we ask some questions now, or what do you think? I would love to, um, but I first want to thank you all. Thank you so much, Julian, for your generosity today. Thank you, Raphael and Donatian, for your wonderful questions. Um, we're going to kind of flip the script today. We usually end with a question or comment from Fong, but we are going to open it up today with uh, publisher and artistic director of The Rail. Over to you, Fong. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, thank you, Julian. Thank you, Raphael and Donia Chien. Um, a lot of ideas came forth from this conversation. First of all, um, when you mentioned about decompose and recompose, Donia Chien, uh, of the image embedded. I can't help but to think of those paintings as if they are excavated site. You know, it's like a quarry being excavated for rock, stone, sand, mineral, and whatnot. And I think that is very interesting way of looking at them from different size. And then the whole concept of beauty and monstrosity is so intensely and eloquently expressed. You probably remember most of you anyway, the beautiful poem uh, by Baudelaire is called One O'Clock in the Morning. Do you remember when the end he says, souls of though I have loved, souls of though I have sung, strengthen me, support me, rid but me of lies and the corrupting vapors of the world. And you, O oh Lord God, grant me a few beautiful verses that prove to me that I'm not the lowest of men that I'm not inferior to those I despise. I used to remember the whole poem, but that's, I think <coughs> it lies in between. But I have two questions for you, Julian. One is one of the most beautiful highlight to go into St. Mark bookstores when I first came to New York in the late eighties was to have discovered Hanuman books, you remember? the great Hanuman books. And one of them was solely about Jean Genet to essay. One, it was called Rembrandt's Secret. Mm -hmm. And the other one was great. What remains of a Rembrandt painting torn into four equal pieces and flushed down the toilet. You remember that essay at all, Raphael Donachian? It was written in 67, I think, where he encountered how sat across him from the train, Jean Genet speaking, recounting the experience from the old man sat across him. Old man whose face was filled with gravity and difficult life experience. And then for one instant, he and that old man became one. And therefore he understood the significance of the late Rembrandt self-portrait because Rembrandt is no longer the proud, talented Rembrandt when he was younger, but rather after his two wife died, Titus, his son died, the whole business went bankrupt, no money. And then he paid himself as an ordinary old man, Julian. So that's where the whole idea of self and self-portrait lie that in the middle of that assimilated subtle, you know, one strand of hair that separate the concept of beauty and monstrosity or recompose or compose. And I'm just asking whether you knew that essay, and that's number one question. I come no. to number two later, can you, <laughs> were you aware of that essay? No, but Obviously, uh, somehow uh, painting those paintings, I'm already dead. Cool. Well, that's a good question. Answer. All right. Number two question. 
I remember talking to Ron Gorchop, you know, Julian, and he was talking about you. He said that um, you love monumental form. And in talking about you, Ron recall his own experience reading somewhere when Rodin was making the monumental Balzac, portrait of Balzac, and he didn't like the way it looked somehow, and he took a slat hammer and he gave it a hit and it gave a twist of energy. And I'm wondering whether you have done that, hammering some part of the plate painting occasionally. Um. Well, in this particular, uh, in this particular group of paintings, I didn't knock the plates off uh, when they were uh, disturbing the face or more difficult to deal with. Um, I have on occasion, um, or painting is just, it's funny because, uh, I don't know who was doing something, but they didn't tie the painting to the uh, uh, to the to the uh, what's it called those those cart, the oh. cart that it was they didn't tie it and the wind blew and it landed on its face ah and so I reglued uh, the painting or put back whatever in any order and then repainted I uh, that happens on occasion I mean there's a painting that I made for my son that had this large uh, protrusion on over one eye. I really thought about smacking it with a hammer, but I didn't do it. I left it on there. So it's rare. Uh, but on the other hand, absolutely, if I'm making a sculpture or different things, there's many times where I've taken a chainsaw or something like that and just cut something off. Or uh, all the sculptures basically are uh, me reconstituting other sculptures that I made and reconfiguring them. And uh, they change a lot and become uh, something else. But the recycling is, uh, is something that I like to do. Great. Well, I'd, uh, I turn it over, but I must say this, Julian. Uh, your first plate painting is called, it's interesting, it's called Patients and Doctors. And it's also plurals, Patients and Doctors. And I think in a way, Donna Chien, Raphael, and it's, he's doing both. Julian is being <laughs> play both side of the doctors in multiple way and the patients simultaneously too. We'll talk more, Julian. I just want to turn, also congratulate on Julian, newborn uh, baby. Esme, yes, she's uh, two weeks old. She's two weeks old, can't wait to see her. And, um, not bad for a father who has so much energy and love to give away. Okay, uh, back to you, Nikki, for the next questions. Well, thank you, Fong. Oh, one more thing, I wanna say one yes. more thing. Thank you for the poem, Fung. The poem was superb that you wrote about the show, unexpected. First time I've seen a poem written by the editor and publisher of, of, a, of a magazine, I think, of an art magazine, certainly. Thank you for that. Well, you, you're welcome, Julian. I, I enjoy it very much writing it. Back to you, Nikki. Well, thank you both. And uh, we'll post a link to that, uh, to that poem review uh, in the chat. So uh, next, I'm going to pass the mic over to our friend, Lynn Crawford. Lynn, you can turn on your mic now. Hi. Thank you. Please don't jump on me if you um, don't like this question. OK. It would be um, impossible. You're on the other side of this computer. I know, but still. Okay. Um, when you had the image of um, Willem as Van Gogh in the hospital, and you were talking about the unease he felt, and how that um, inaugurated a sort of activity, right? Sort of launched a leap and and sort of a frenzied action. I kept wondering if unease, if you don't also see unease as leading to um, to sort of almost uh, passivity, you know, I mean, if you think about like, I prefer not to, you know, that great Bartleby phase, but even something else where it's sort of this bleak nothing, as opposed to an articulated kinetic, the, you know, the, the articulated kinetic responses that you so beautifully depict. But do you ever think 
in your mind, are you balancing them with that? Uh, whatever a, a vacancy means to you. Well, I think if you think about that particular scene, which you probably should maybe rewatch. He's I'm not quite... talking about the scene. No, I'm oh, not talking about the scene. I'm talking about your approach. I'm talking about just how you're looking at passivity versus action. Right. Uh, so I don't understand your question. I'm, I'm curious, you've said a lot about activity and action. Oh, and, and, oh, how does activity balance and with passivity? Kin kinetics, and I'm passivity? curious, because there is stillness in your work. I feel like there's always been stillness in your work and there's always have been pauses in it. And I just haven't heard, heard you speak about it today. So I'm curious to oh, hear okay. you talk about it because it's not relentless. It's very, it's, well, it's I very think, even okay, flow, I get it. I I get it. So if we talk, if we think about, for example, if we think about, for example, okay, the movie, uh, I sent uh, Benoit Delhomme to, um, to Scotland because there was no more uh, wheat in France. They had cut the wheat fields down. And I wanted Willems to, or Van Gogh to be walking through the wheat field. And so I wanted, I sent um, Benoit there so he would shoot his feet. So Benoit is shooting his feet mm -hmm. wearing Willem's clothes and we're telling, really we're telling Willem's story of by the person who's looking at his feet while he's walking and I think in that sense it's very introspective it's very sort of uh, utilitarian in a way we all have to walk somehow but uh, I think it's also um uh, instead of showing him doing it, a lot of time is spent just in the doing than in, instead of showing him, which, which in a sense, I think is a, a, the other side of, of, I mean, there is action, but for example, in the diving bell and the butterfly, we're making a motion picture about a guy that can't move. So he can blink his eye what is not dead or is not paralyzed is his imagination and his left eye. And so uh, you're inside of his body also in the first person. Uh, and I think that kind of uh, inner life that exists in these movies has to do also with a, a certain amount of, of claustrophobia uh, that I think people feel or it's scary to people, but or when they sewed his eye up, uh, He's not moving. Somebody else is doing that to him. So, um, no, I, we, I guess we're talking about the act of painting or the act of, uh, it's very physical to make a movie. And also, if you think of him climbing up the side of this hill or me having to walk everywhere where we wanted to film, which was further than I intended to walk. But if you want to capture that, you have to, that's why I say I don't think people are acting. They are, we're, we're, they're just being in a situation. And I don't know if I'm answering your question or not, but um, for example, the young man who's talking to Willem, who I think did a great job, but until he did what he did, he was too nice to Willem. And I, and I, and I said, well, you're too happy. I'm like, why do you like this guy? Because he's the, the actor that you know, or, why should you give him this credit? Didn't this guy just cut his ear off and, and scare these different, and the guys just ended up sitting in front of you. So why are you so nice to him? And we had to kind of review what th happened in his life that might set up a different dynamic that when he came in and we redid the scene. And so um, I think there is a kind of a way of receiving activity or actions that are just as powerful as the- Oh, actor. absolutely. And that film's a beautiful example of it. And so is your work. Well, it's just know. nice I, to hear I you talk about it. Or, but there you go. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Anything Bye. else? Yes, I'm, I'm gonna pass the mic now over to our friend, G.E. Schwartz. G.E., you can turn your mic on now. Hi, thank you so much. And- um, Amazing on so many levels. Um, my question is, are shows and projects like this one, are they catalysts for more work in a different direction? And if so, how? I mean, where's this going? Oh, well, 
I made those paintings in the course of about, I guess, a year and a half from the time that I was finished making the film and I took some of the props from the movie and I made paintings out of them. I didn't know how long I was gonna do that. And I didn't know that I was gonna make three paintings of each one or, but I felt like I needed to examine that a bit more and I wasn't satisfied with just that. I had to dissect the experience for myself and the viewer. I also wanted to show all of those paintings together. And so, uh, and I didn't wanna just be stuck making paintings of Vincent van Gogh. I wanted to look at other palettes of paintings that have been made in other moments in the different centuries and what portraiture meant. Uh, the idea of, of and, I, and you get all of those paintings by other people, whether it be, uh, um, uh, I'm thinking about a Dutch painter right now. Uh, my brain just, I just sometimes, I just had a baby or my wife had a baby two weeks ago and I'm a little- yeah, Congratulations uh, by the way. Yeah, she's really, it was, it was an extraordinary, very, the baby's cool. My wife is super cool. And uh, it was all went well. Uh, but uh, no, I felt like that was the end of those 25 paintings. And uh, I still, I paint portraits of people. I, I met Lawrence Wiener on the street the other day. We've been friends for, known him for almost 50 years. And uh, he, I wanted to make a painting him. So he came over and I painted a portrait of him the other day. Um, I like to paint from life. And I've done that consistently. I didn't really return to the plate paintings. I've always made portraits of people over the years, but I've always liked to make, let's see, I don't know if you will, can I do this? Can I go like that? I don't know if you could see that painting. Yes, yes. Or, or there's a pair of those goat paintings there. And anyway, I'm just gonna, or there's a flower, painting with flowers over there. Anyway, uh, which I never thought I was going to do when I painted the first plate painting. Okay, why am I, I don't want to look at, my, oh, oh, that's because, I don't want to look at myself, I'm, hi. So um, then after doing that, I, I felt like painting some paintings that didn't have recognizable images on them. Uh, and so I painted a group of, you want to eat? Okay, I'll be in there in a few minutes. So uh, I painted paintings on this material that I found covering a toy store in the middle of the jungle in Mexico. And I thought the pink that had been bleached by the sun was so extraordinary that uh, I bought the, the cover of the guy's store and, and stretched it and made some paintings out of it. And um, so there's always been all of these sort of parallel lives that my practice sort of uh, takes on. And, um, and I, years ago, I referred it to sort of uh, um, farming, you know, where you, you cook, you plant potatoes for a while and then you plant tomatoes. Uh, and so uh, where is it going? Uh, I'm just trying to think of what the last, I painted these paintings of the flowers in the, uh, in the driveway that my son Vito showed at his gallery on 19th street during the summer. And then uh, I've been painting some paintings recently of a, there was a house without, um, without any electricity or water at my wife's, uh, that belonged to my wife's grandparents in the middle of the, the countryside and near a lake in, in Sweden. So her brother sent a picture of this house and I took a swim in that lake, uh, made a painting of the house. Uh, the left side of the painting I painted with a brush, the right side of the painting I painted with my fingers. Uh, so it's, a, it's an idyllic house in a landscape and I painted a white mark over it or a couple white marks similar to this, the way they would intervene somehow. And I don't really see uh, a hierarchical difference between something that you can recognize or a piece of material that you recognize but you're not interpreting anything as you deal with it. I don't know if that's an answer, but, uh, but I'm, I'm busy doing things. I mean, there, uh, my son Olmo was driving through Sicily and he saw these billboards that had been redacted. Then he thought they looked like paintings of mine. And when he sent me the image, I made some billboard paintings that don't look like those things, but configured into something else. But they have, they have 
uh, stilts. They're painting it on stilts. And you'll see them someday, but I did that too recently. No, it's a lot like nowadays divagations. One thing just could lead to another or not, and then we have something different. So it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, GE, and um, thank you, Julian. We look forward to, to see these billboard paintings one day. Um, I, I want to thank you all once more for this wonderful conversation. Um, thank you to everyone that asked questions. Um, I think now is a good time to go over to poetry and a thank you to those uh, that sent in questions that we couldn't get to. But um, here at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. So I am thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Andre Kodrescu to the stage. Uh, author Andre Kodrescu was born in Cebu, Transylvania, Romania and emigrated to the United States in 1966. He is the author of numerous books, poems, novels, and essays. He founded Exquisite Corpse, a journal of books and ideas, and was a regular commentator on NPR's All Things Considered. He taught literature and poetry at John Hopkins University, the University of Baltimore, and Louisiana, Louisiana State University. Uh, Andre, the mic is now yours. One more thing, right before yes. Andre comes on, I don't want to interrupt him. Could you send me those questions? Absolutely. Right now, I will. Whenever. Just be curious. Whether, okay, excuse me. Andre. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nick. And uh, thank you, Julian, for being so uh, uh, articulate about your work and uh, sane about it. <laughs> it's not often you hear painters actually speaking so uh, articulately about their work. That's why you need us, the poets, to do uh, and I noticed that you did make references, everyone in the conversation made references to poets and poetry. So um, without us, uh, you use us as props, I think, to, uh, <laughs> to, to continue your conversations with yourselves. And uh, well, there's, you know. a very, there's a very uh, beautiful exhibition of Rene Ricard paintings with his poems written on them at Vito's gallery right now. Okay. Uh, you might find. Yeah, I know Rene, yes, indeed, he was a walking poem. He could... I'll read two works, one is, uh, they are, uh, one is called Metaphors on Fire, and uh, I'm sure uh, they, they relate. There are no passive or reversible metaphors. You turn something into something else, it stays that way. I think of how we treat others, other species, other times. They were once metaphors. Prototypes transformed by utility. A horse was metaphors. An ant, a cigarette is a glass of milk. 1970 anthem. There is a lot of wisdom on television. It was once a newspaper blown by the wind. This summer, the play of life and death the daily search for food were once a pigeon on my roof. The fight for survival is fun, violent, alcoholic. Once it was a love shop. Death is a ghost dog indigenous people kill for food. Responsible for our own economy, we're a small group of metaphors where everyone turns everyone into whatever feeds the overt mood. No matter, my matter will go into the forms of matter my comrades oddly need. I am so lucky to have this matter and time to have matter and gang in the horror dome. We poets soothe by moving the camera now, hyper close, now far. Mysteries multiply when we bring our friends to turn into cabbage rolls or spirits. The stock market keeps going up. Our wave of the statistically poor takes back the city from the tourists who live in the technicolor version of black and white childhoods, blissful under the rain umbrellas of ancient classrooms we made restaurants, our inexhaustible menu. The drone of history bent on ideology describes much of what we know as malleable inside the atomic novel of metaphor a rain of words in the taste buds of any soul, directing its affections and weaknesses to our metaphors, 
palliatives for a world of loss under attack by pronouns, but capable of love. Truth gets in the way, a vertical Berlin wall in Brooklyn. Language, poverty, madness, change, ungendered lump of memes to discontented restlessness. Progress, men said, then he was a bird. I'm going to read one more, which is a prose work. It's called Dear Meat. What's your point? Yes, you were ahead of your time when you presented your dystopia to the class, but nobody applauded. That was 100 years ago. It was hubris. It was the same hubris that propels you now, but it is no longer prescience or vision. It is just kvetch. Your body got there along with every other body, though yours is experiencing extreme ennui. Been there in my mind. There is a bittersweet quality to retrovisionary ennui. If anything, one way meat was always planned obsolescence. Look at me now, I move, I sing, I fuck, and I feel no pain. And I don't have just one body, I have many of every sex, color, and dimension. What do you mean it doesn't smell? See that little icon of a huffing nose with expanded nostrils on the right side of your screen? Push it, and the effluvia menu pops up. Smell to die for wafts out. You are in the bubble bath of infinity, smelling like a rare orchid or a vile cabbage turd. When you had your meat body, you never had such olfactory possibilities. Here are one million orgasms impossible in meat space. Death has been abolished. When you move into the virtual world, you don't need much. No clothes, no furniture, no shoes, no school. You simply walk into the blindingly white screen holding your tablet. When meat dies, the memory of you stays behind within the meat memory of those who knew you. They will soon follow tablets clutched like genitals at an army physical. When your meat body dies, you won't. There will be enough copies to eliminate the embarrassment of regret. As a copy reaches another copy, there is no need for tears. I am you. Our lives as narrated by engineers are a still unsophisticated thing. They're still unsophisticated now. They will get better when the bots will understand neurally how we think. My first reality replacement was the light switch in our apartment. I turned it on and it wasn't night anymore. I lived without all my meat life, keeping two realities in mind simultaneously. It was night and it was day too. It was dark and it was light at the same time. The reality replacing machine made things interesting. For animals, it is always dark at night, unless they live with us. There is no such thing as an avant-garde body, only a mind located in meat. Suicide is the only avant-garde. With the flesh gone, we live forever. Says so of my pandemic, <laughs> pandemia thoughts. You know, they're kind of the very, few. very. Thank you, very, 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 very much, thank and uh, thank you for reading it while I was involved in this program. Well, thank you very much for speaking of your work, which I've always liked and admired. Well, I I will continue to thank you. So thank you so much, Andre, for that reading. Thank you once again, Julian, Donishen, and Raphael for joining us today. Um, I'd like to also thank. Uh, all of our friends over at the Brandt Foundation and Pace Gallery for helping to make today's program possible. Uh, we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel, where we will upload today's conversation within the next day. And we're here every day at 1 p.m. So join us tomorrow for our 62nd Radical Poetry Reading curated by Micah Ballard. Uh, but well, one now, other thing, Nick, the yes. show is up till the 31st of December. So if people want to see the paintings in the flesh, they can go there. It's yes. Uh, thank you. And yes, yeah, so we just I'll post that once more in the in the chat. It's on view until the 30th at the Brandt Foundation. And for those of you that can't unfortunately make it, there is a live virtual tour on the website that you can check out. Um, and I'll post that again in the chat. But for now, uh, thank you all. And I want to uh, invite you all to turn on your mics to say hello and goodbye as you go and to um, have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.
Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you. 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 Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Fun. Thank you. Thank you, Fun. Thanks, Fun. Thank you, Andre. Oh, go thank see you. the show you got. Yeah. You gotta go see it in flash to see the surfaces and the subtleties of form being very or both. The excavated surface. So yeah. Okay. Much love. Happy Thanksgiving. Love Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Raphael. Yeah, Everybody, thank you for your effort. Have, have a good Welcome, Julian. Thank you. Andre, thank you for your poem thank you. again. Thank you. Thank you all. Take care. Be safe. Thank Happy you. holidays, everyone. Time for a whipping lunch. Ciao. Enjoy your lunch. Yes. Grazie. Ciao. Ciao.